Hi, this is Tom Needham, and you're listening to The Sounds of Film, and I am so excited to have on the phone with us once again, Peter Joseph. He's known for his zeitgeist films and the zeitgeist movement. He's also the author of the best-selling book, The New Human Rights Movement, Reinventing the Economy to End Oppression. His book inspired his latest film, which is called Interreflections. It's the first film of a trilogy. It's an experimental film, and it has a lot of social commentary in it. Peter, I am so excited to finally get a chance to speak to you about your new movie. Thanks for coming on The Sounds of Film again. Hey, it's my pleasure, Tom. I appreciate you having me on. Oh, man. Peter, congratulations first off. This is uh, quite a film you've made. I've, I've never seen a movie quite like this. It's very ambitious. It's long. Uh, it's experimental, as I mentioned. And uh, you make so many various points in this film. Um, you really went all out with this movie, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, it was a, uh, it was definitely a work of passion that went well, went on way too long in production and cost far more than expected. It's kind of a, a tour de force of what I'm capable of with a very low budget um, and with a very very serious artistic side to it. Uh, you know, the, the book that I wrote, the New Human Rights Movement, is a very academic book, highly sourced about social theory and why we need economic change and so on which has always been, you know, part of my work for the past 10, 15 years as an activist. <clears throat> but I wanted to do something different. So I said to myself, I'm going to make something out of this content that just is not going to be the same documentary style. And I, I, it was actually quite organic in the sense that I structured the film in this sort of oscillation between the three timelines, as you probably noticed, but I kind of like set certain rules where I didn't know what was going to happen in other contexts, if this makes any sense, where I didn't quite know what I was going to end up with. I didn't know how long the film was going to be. I organized it in an improvisatory manner, believe it or not, even though it's very well structured. But there's also a kind of freedom to it that should be perceivable when you watch it, where the film feels like it deviates in ways that you typically wouldn't expect from a film, because the whole point of a film by traditional filmmaking standards is you lock someone in, you keep them in some kind of suspense with your traditional formula and story, and then you bring them through this arc of narrative and you come out the other side with some kind of resolution. And, of course, I do have that in this sort of science fiction layer, science fiction satire layer in the work, but I wanted to purposefully, uh, in my ambition as an experimental artist in many ways, coming from a deeply musical background, which I love experimental music, the avant-garde, I wanted to try to incorporate that. And... David Lynch was a big influence, people like Aronofsky. You know, I, I just wanted to do something different. And to the extent that it achieves a notable goal uh, is to be questioned. I think the film is going to make its own audience, is the way I describe it to people. Um, I've watched the reception as it's been released over the past week, and of course, true to form, it's highly polarized. Either people love it or they hate it, and I kind of expected that. But I, I kind of hope, hope that another kind of audience emerges that sort of understands the challenge posed by the film, not only its challenge to the social system, which is what I'm about intellectually in my activism, but also the challenge of art itself. Like, why do we use these formulas and the, the, and the methods uh, and the structures in media, in film or music or anything else? And how do we go about breaking those forms? Which, again, is why you know, my influence of people like David Lynch and even the early avant-garde filmmakers, uh, which I'm sure you're kind of familiar with, attempted to do. You know, hit or miss, but... Um, so that's kind of a general summation. I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe you could share with our audience, you, you said you've been getting a lot of feedback, both positive and negative. Uh, what has been some of the feedback that you've been receiving? Well, I think the, the way the film is structured and the length of the film lends itself to people that <laughs> when they start it, they have a certain expectation and they don't realize that the film forces them to think actively, and there are going to be subjects and words and intellectual elements that not everyone's familiar with, which usually most screenwriters work against because they're trying to capture the largest audience. So most people that seem apprehensive towards the film tend, I, I think, to feel intimidated by it, and I don't mean that from a, you know, a, 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 some kind of standing on a pedestal standpoint, but they're just not willing to put in the time. The film reads like a book in a way. You, yeah. If you have to stop the film and, and pause to make sure you understand what's happening, it's recommended. If you have to break the film up and not watch it all at once, you can do that as well, even though I don't encourage that. But I, I like the film as an active work of challenge, as I said prior, not only stylistically but intellectually. And I tend to find whether, well, first of all, you have people that hate the fundamental premise because they're 
generally locked into a polarization politically. So, you know, if you promote something along the lines of what appears to be socialism by default, you're going to have a huge swath of people that dislike whatever you're saying. Uh, and that's, you know, gotten unfortunately even more unnuanced as time has moved forward with the existence of the you know, highly anti-socialistic rhetoric of people like Donald Trump and the reemergence of a hyper-conservative uh, mentality. But I think beyond that, first of all, by the way, I'm not promoting socialism in the film whatsoever, but this is the way people block things in. So you have to fight that inherent bias that people have politically about what's being talked about socially, because there is, you know, endless dialogue uh, and you know, a great deal of information that's put forward through my academics of the future. Uh, but anyway, I won't go through the structure of the film as of yet, but the most hostility either comes from people that hate the ideology, who probably even know my work from before, or they hate the design of the film because it just doesn't grab them in the way they're used to experiencing it. And I would say to that, you know, when you watch a film like 2001 Space Odyssey, you're going to have that point where you're not quite understanding where you're going. And by the way, I'm not comparing myself to Kubrick and never would. <laughs> but you don't, you're not quite understanding where the film's going to take you. And I think there's a vulnerability to that that people need to relinquish. They need to acquiesce to getting into what the film is suggesting and not try to fight it as they watch it. And then that's that's pretty much the, where the hostility I think comes from, at least in my opinion. Now they will have a, your, you'll have your traditional film buffs, of course. And I've talked to some, talked to some reviewers that really hated it, <laughs> and they hated it because of the standpoint that it is the, in the ambitious nature that it is, or they don't understand the complications of shooting an entire film on green screen virtually, and the compromises have to be made stylistically when you do that. So that was a unique decision. I'll never do that again. It was far more difficult um, for my team and mainly myself to do what needed to be done, considering the experimental requirements that I wanted. Some of it, I think, looks really, really good. Some of it is just very much an avant-garde abstraction. And the way I cater to that, by the way, not to deviate too much from your point, is if you watch the film, you might remember, Tom, at the opening before the debate in space happens, they appear on a stage. Yeah. To care, and they appear, they return to that stage two more times, and then at the very end, there's a fake ending where all of my characters from all, from all three timelines enter into this theater to watch the great debate. And the great debate is this stage performance that exists in a parallel reality as opposed to the, the fictional depiction. Well, it's all fictional, but the depiction in space where they're literally in front of the Earth in the CGI environment. And I do that because I think the stage performance is how you have to understand this film. The film is meta. It's very much self-aware. It's constantly referencing itself over and over again to remind the audience that this is just an abstract piece of media that someone like myself has created to try to get a point across. So I hope those kind of nuances are picked up upon. Um, so when people look at like a green screen composite, they're like, well, I don't think that looks as good as it should. They're not allowing for the suspension of disbelief that I think comes to people naturally when they watch a stage performance because the stage performance doesn't have that kind of environment. You have to use your imagination. So the film very dangerously walks those lines, and I, I like the fact that it, it actually is discordal in that way. I like the fact that some of it's kind of really awkward to look at. I like the, the strong challenge it makes aesthetically to people. Um, I think it, it serves a great utility, in fact, as a commentary on uh, how we've become so formalized in the way we respect film and even art in general. Well, it's, it's funny. You even... It seems like maybe you suspected that there would be some criticism because um, it, you, you break all the walls <laughs> in this movie. Like you're in the film and then sometimes the, the scenes are cut and, and then someone says at some point that the film seems pretentious or, or like... <laughs> so um, I loved it though. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you um, related to the stage scene is, if I remember correctly, wasn't your zeitgeist film originally um, some kind of like avant-garde stage production that you were doing in New York City or something like that? Yeah, that's that's right. It was, believe it or not, it was never supposed to be a film. It was never supposed to be released. I didn't own any of the material in the film. It was a personal project that I did in 2007. In, in Chinatown, there was a little black box theater. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I rented it out for six nights. I had a large percussion array. I'm a, I was trained and for many years pursued a classical musician career, uh, moonlighting, doing all sorts of other things when I was in New York, uh, doing off-Broadway shows and so on. And as I worked at this time in advertising and doing stuff I really didn't care for, I wanted to just do something for myself. So I, I had been reading lots of stuff and been fascinated by pop culture topics of that time and kind of coalesced it all in this really haphazard uh, assault on the viewer <laughs> known as Zeitgeist. 
And I had no idea when I, when I threw it up at the suggestion of a friend on what was Google Video back then, which was the only place you could put a feature film length upload. You know, YouTube was just a bunch of cat videos that were like 12 minutes max. It went incredibly viral, and I was shocked, and I had to scramble to do what I could with right stuff, and you know, not to get sued, and and it became this epic, uh, ridiculously viral thing, and it took on a life of its own, sometimes in ways that I don't prefer. Um, but my life, unfortunately, has been codified as the zeitgeist guy, uh, for better or for worse, and I accept that. And I've tried to do my best with that kind of public appeal to you know bring in more socially conscious activism. Because believe it or not, if you watch my first film, as, as extreme in its commentary as it is, my actual worldview is not particularly of that nature. This is a deeply artistic film uh, that really wanted to challenge using truth and, not fiction, but truth and implication, where I wanted to keep these, the person on the seat, on the edge of their seat, to not quite understand what is true and what isn't, or what may be true and what isn't, and therefore this need for critical thought. And the best, the best compliment I ever had in that movie was some people I met in Germany, and they said that they went to school, they went to film school, and they had an entire class that for many, many days went directly through Zeitgeist One to learn about filmmaking and the filmmaking approach in a very, a very orchestrated and, and theoretical way. I was like, wow, really? Hmm. They're teaching around this film in terms of its design? That's incredible. So if you listen to the film, if you watch like I said, it's a musical piece. That's why I like this great that your show is called Sounds of Film. Um, I wrote the first Zeitgeist as a musical piece, and that's why it's so heavily musically oriented. And it really wouldn't be the same, I think, aesthetically if the music wasn't so uh, effective. But anyway, I can ramble on and on about that phenomenon. But yeah, that's how I kind of came to be where I am now is through that piece. I never intended to be a filmmaker, never. Well, I'm glad that you did. And uh, and, I, and I do love the music. I've played a, uh, the soundtrack uh, quite a bit on the sounds of film. Um, you know, th- there's there's so much to get into, but but you mentioned before that some people, I think you said, mistakenly th- thought that you were promoting socialism in your in your new film. I, I think maybe it would be helpful to to people that just tuned in if maybe you can explain uh, the politics or the philosophy that you're trying to expound in this movie. Sure. So I I became disenfranchised with this sort of political left right and ism reality long ago. It didn't take much for me to realize that people have just been locking themselves into these boxes of ideology, and basically the associations get so polarized that you bring up something, you know, basic and fundamental, such as a Sanders, Bernie Sanders-oriented policy of universal health care for all, and instead of seeing that as a rational public health service, which would make perfect sense, that would improve the economy as it exists and so on, you have this huge swath of people that just slap the label socialism on it, on it, and then they think that if you have that kind of institution, it's going to lead to some kind of greater tyranny and all the propaganda of historical anti-communist stuff. So that's been largely out there, and the way I circumvent that, as I say, this is a system science perspective. This is an epidemiological perspective. What I mean by that is if you take a view that it has to do with the integrity of the function of a system, In other words, it's completely abstracted from anything related to capitalism or socialism or anyism. It's like what works and what doesn't. It's like looking at an engine of a car, and you're trying to decide if the design of this engine is the most efficient it should be. Or maybe there are such critically latent and bad designs uh, that you have to get rid of the entire engine. So if you take that kind of of systems science perspective, and I hate to throw that word out there because people don't usually know what that means, uh, I'm a big fan of, of system science researchers like Stafford Beer and this old world of cybernetics, which, again, people really are not familiar with it, but it has to do with the integrity of systems, understanding why nature's systems work the way they do, and then you compare that to our man-made systems, and you try to figure out the discord. And the discord is huge. So effectively, when I criticize the social system of the world today, market capitalism, I'm not coming at it from an ideological or a Marxist standpoint. I'm coming at it from a system science standpoint to say that this kind of structure that we have, a society based on infinite growth and labor and resource exploitation for income, uh, this paradox that we have where we're supposedly being conservative in our scarcity world uh, with this kind of market system, supposedly we are preserving scarcity, excuse me, supposedly we are evading scarcity by strategic use through markets, when at the same time we're actually promoting infinite consumption. So let me just make that point really clear. 
we have an entire ethic in our society that tolerates poverty and homelessness and all of this atrociousness uh, of the lower class, both domestically and across the world. More than half of the world lives on less than $5.50 a day. That is poverty. Forget what the UN says. I challenge anybody to go anywhere in the world and live on $5.50 a day. So you have this system that says we can't possibly provide for everyone. We can't possibly give Americans health insurance. Yet at the same time, in that contradiction, you have it promoting infinite growth and infinite consumption. Because what is it about the system that has to remain, as we've seen with COVID-19, with a 30% drop in GDP? People aren't buying and consuming. So you have this completely paradoxical system that is falling in on itself. It makes no sense in its own logic. And that's the angle that I come from. And that's just one point, by the way, in terms of, in terms of the lack of compatibility of this system. The ecological crisis is not a result of a bunch of corporations that don't care. It's because we live in a system based on, on infinite economic growth. And there's no incentive for people to slow down and wanting to sell you something. I mean, the entire market system is literally established by you and I having to sell somebody else something, right? Everyone is in the market to sell themselves or sell what they make to somebody else, and that's all everyone does in this kind of social system, which is fundamentally destructive and anti-ecological, hence anti-economic. You know, the Greek word economy means economia, which means the management of a household. And the analogy I use <clears throat> When you think about GDP growth and all of this and how it's all about you know, getting more and more people to buy things, to create jobs, would you ever do that in your own home? Would you ever go into your kitchen and use everything as fast as possible and just so you can go out and buy more things? No, that would be utterly uneconomical. And yet that's what the entire structure of our economy actually incentivizes. So hence it's no, no surprise that we have complete ecological decline on this planet not because of the interests of a rogue corporation or a corrupt political institution, but because that is just what the system does. So we can't expect conservative sustainability or you know, efficiency-oriented things in this kind of model. So I'll, I'll stop there, but that's why I don't give in to any of these, these isms, because they have no relevance to me. Uh, they're, and plus, you can't even define them. Even socialism isn't even a really definable concept. You can define capitalism vaguely because we see the behavior of it. Socialism is a complete abstraction that has never really been utilized in any kind of true definition, and it doesn't even matter. It's just a, it's just a sad talking point that political pundits throw around to scare people, and it's uh, most acute, of course, here in the U.S., and, you know, and so on. So I'll stop there. We're speaking with Peter Joseph. You're listening to The Sounds of Film, and his new film is um, Inter... Reflections based on the book The New Human Rights Movement. Um, there, there's so much that you talked about there. Um, I think somewhere in the midst of what you, you talked about, uh, you mentioned exploitation of workers. Uh, and, and that is an idea that comes up in both the book and in the film, obviously. Um, what have you learned through the years in your work about the way that labor is exploited in society? Well, let's first not reduce it to just a class war relationship yet. Everybody is exploited by everybody. So it's not that the, the problem is the power hierarchy that's inevitable to this kind of model. We are going to ultimately have people that have more money and more resources, born, whether they're born into it or that they acquire it, and they become, they become machines that are always going to have the advantage. So that's why you have the billionaire class. That's why you have these massive corporations with the power that they do, and hence the rollover into government power and so on. But going back to your issue, it, the entire thing is based on labor exploitation one way or another because of cost efficiency. Again, it's not a socialist ism. It's, it's the fact that that's just what the system is. So if I, as an independent filmmaker, as I have with this film, you know, struggling to get this thing done and not spend any more money because I went back, I mean, I went into great debt because of this movie, I have to look for people that are going to do things cheaper than somebody else. And that is fundamentally exploitative. That is looking for, say, a student that just got out of college that's in terrible debt, and they're not, they have to have a job, so they're willing to look, work less for you. This seems natural to us. It seems like some kind of efficiency in a way, but it's not. It is fundamentally uh, in disregard of the person that's being employed because of their pre-existing vulnerabilities. So when you take that perception, it becomes a very different kind of argument. And then you start to look at the sociological level of what happens in a society that's based on this kind of 
uh, a fundamental competition. It's competition between each other. Workers are in competition with each other to get a job. The the owner is in competition with the worker to pay the least amount, while the worker is in competition with the owner to get the most amount for their labor as far as a wage. And it goes on and on. Countries at war with each other because of their economies, as we see through economic warfare, tariffs, sanctions, and so on. Uh, so this kind of ethic, when you build it out, of literally everybody at war with everybody else in economic competition can't be a positive force in the long run for civilization. It served its role at its minimum capacity over the course of time, and, you know, obviously you can't dismiss the ages of slavery going back to ancient Egypt, all based on economic efficiency, cost efficiency, so to speak, once again. I, as I talk about deliberately in the book for an extended chapter, the American slave trade, the American util utilization of African imported slaves was immediately a financial issue. It was not a race issue. I, I denoted this recently in a podcast I did. The racial definition, the difference between black and white, those terms weren't even used, came after slavery was instituted as a means of justification and social control. So it's a construct that's been created. Now, I don't want to go too far on that because it's a whole different subject, but at the root of all of this human oppression in the most abject sense, abject human slavery is the same thing. It's competition for cost efficiency and finding ways to justify the abuse of other people. And that's just what the system is. So does that make sense to you? Sure, it does. Uh, I'm sure, though, that there are some people that are listening, and um, maybe they're similar to some of the critics that you mentioned, who you know, maybe would not agree with everything that you're saying. And, and one of the things that I love in this movie that you mentioned earlier is that you have this running uh, great debate that's going on throughout the film where you, you, you do see a conversation between two people with a opposing viewpoints where they can kind of battle out the ideas. Can, can you explain the function of that debate in the movie yeah. and, and, and what it is that's happening in that discussion that's so important? So... I uh, think the three three layers of the film are three genres, just to give a, an overview. You have three timelines and three different genres and three different periods of time. There's a silent film that follows a character that's, that's labeled 23, that's her only known name, and she goes through a horror movie, basically, a silent film horror movie. That was probably the more creative and more interesting uh, uh, layer of it in terms of the special effects and so on, even though it's, it's very primitive. And then the second layer has to do with these academics of the future that are 120 years from now, if I remember correctly. And they are literally um, talking about the way life used to be in the past. And the third layer you speak of is the, is the core narrative, which carries the sci-fi satire from the beginning all the way to the end. And if I ever do make a sequel, it will continue that same line as well. And it deals with two cliche characters. You have a protagonist and an antagonist. One sits on one side of the big table and the other one on the other side of the big table. And in the backdrop is the Earth, because they're in space, the headquarters of this fictional, satirical, global security agency. <laughs> and the way I wrote this is exactly the way you described it, is I wanted to really home in on the two opposing arguments, particularly the opposing argument, the socially Darwinistic argument, the, the Thomas Malthusian argument, where people think that you just have to allow for the destruction of other human beings by the hand of the system as if it's normal. So you don't help the poor. This is how Thomas Malthus, who I quote at the very, very beginning of the film, this is what he wrote about in his population control book years and years ago. He's like, you should just not help these people. You should not help the poor and the sick. So anyway, the point with these two characters is the, the kind of B-movie uh, cliché, but built in is this great dialogue, which I'm very proud of, and I thought they executed very well. And I, the beauty of it, with the, the dynamic, is that I, the audience, I think at certain points, and maybe you can clarify this or if you agree, you don't quite know who to believe, right? Yeah. Like, I, I really appreciate the way they acted it because the Simon character is there to, you know, tell John, the protagonist that wants to change the world for the better, that you can't change the world. It's impossible. Humans are this way, and this is just the way it's been, and so on, all those arguments that we tend to hear. And I find that if you really pay attention to the antagonist, there are times where the audience really wants to agree with him, and I, I, I thought that was a good device. I did that deliberately. And then, of course, the John character continues with the general argument, which is sort of my voice in terms of activism anyway. So, yes, and then that carries over to the larger concept of living re versus weaponry. You might remember during the credit sequence, I have a man named R. Buckminster Fuller, a very famous futurist, so to speak. Yeah. And he's talking in the 1970s about, about how, in his experience during World War I, everyone was using all this amazing technology to learn how to blow each other up. 
but nobody was using the same technology to really create positive, uh, sustainable change on the mainland, on in actual society. So he called it livingry versus weaponry. So to get so my point is to get to the very end of that narrative when you know John leaves the scene and then he comes back to the Concordian headquarters and there's that giant hydrogen bomb that is also featured at the very beginning, except it's not a bomb for destruction, it's a bomb for creation. So I really seal in that now that Malthusian versus Fullerian because it's it's Thomas Malthus versus our book Mr. Fuller ultimately, and I use those words in the in the uh, dialogue as well um, to you know really give that arc of the difference in the ideologies. And of course, I have the cliche speech by John at the very end, where he talks about how livingry will always be one step ahead of weaponry. And again, it's built into that motto of the cliche. And throughout, of course, is then self-referencing and reminding the audience that they're actors. And it cuts back to the stage play, which is very important because, to on a certain level, what they're saying has to be viewed in a certain superficiality simultaneously, in order to understand the film's meta level. Uh, uh, existence, where, again, it's you watching a film that knows you're watching it, if that makes any sense to you, yeah. or to the audience listening. <laughs> so, anyway, I hope that summarizes If you have any other specific questions, I'm happy to help, happy to answer them. Yeah, well, well one of the things that I enjoyed is um, on more than one occasion in multiple films of yours, you reference the film Network. Uh, you do it yes. in... Okay, I'm glad you brought that up, yeah. Yeah, so the opening uh, line, you've met, you've met the primal forces of nature, Mr. Beale. Um, and he makes another comment of the Simon character at the very, uh, the fourth scene with them. Um, yes, the reason I had that entire concept for that scene was network. Uh, that scene where they're in the, in the office and he does that railing speech. Um, I, I was always impactful. It was always amazing to me that with the writers of network put in that socially Darwinistic element so acutely and that's stuck in my craw. That's kind of how I define the, the Simon character uh, and, and ultimately was influenced for that entire scene. So I'm glad you picked up on that. That was a big film for you, wasn't it, in terms of yeah. um, being an influence? Yeah, I think so. I mean, network, it, I mean, obviously it's just another movie in a way, but it has a lot of filler. But when it comes to those social commentary comments, uh, network stands on its own uh, when it comes to the character and the fascination of Mr. Beale and then the, that dialogue between business you know, business being the god, as it were. I mean, I don't think anyone, any writer other than the writer of Network has ever put it so acutely. So, yeah, that was very influential. And if anyone's ever heard that, I suggest they pop it up on YouTube and watch that scene. It's, it's, uh, or watch the movie. It's still a very brilliant movie ahead of its time. And I'm hoping one day if you put out um, that's like a special edition DVD, I'd like to be able to just watch the debate, the great debate. Like just by itself yeah. at times, like separate I, uh, from. I thought about that. In fact, uh, I know that film is a challenge for people because of its length and the obscurity of its intertwined narratives. I'm actually consider releasing all three of those layers as separate shorts. Well, that's interesting. So, um, man, um, one of the things that is, is kind of brought up in the film is that the idea of hierarchies that we kind of take for granted in society and that people like um, Jordan Peterson, I don't know if you're familiar with some of his oh, yeah. most recent work, um, they make the case that it's a natural thing. You were kind of alluding to this earlier, um, that, that certain people just rise to the top and if they do, they deserve it. And like you were suggesting before, maybe some people um, don't deserve, according to some um, philosophers and writers, um, What's what's so dangerous about the concept of hierarchies that that really concerns you? It's the fact that it's like everything; it's a blanketed assumption without any nuance. So, in human society and in all primate species, to some degree or another, there are a, a very there, excuse me. There is a vast range. There is a kind of hierarchy that is natural to skill sets. And I guess in the sense of like primitive, you know, very lower brain primates, it is clearly in the architecture of their social relations. But humans are not baboons. Humans are not chimpanzees. I want, first of all, let me, let me preface by saying that the two closest analogs that we have to humans are chimpanzees and bonobos. So chimpanzees have a very typical semi-violent strict hierarchy with men and dom males, excuse me, in dominant positions. And there's the, the chain of hierarchy that people have come to understand in terms of, of social status in that kind of tribal orientation. 
there happens to be another split off from chimpanzees that happened a long time ago called bonobos. Bonobos actually have females in the top of the hierarchy in some arguments, and in some arguments they don't really have any hierarchy. They have very, very low levels of violence. They're known as the sex ape because they, they have a great deal of sex and there's a lot of affection and there's a lot of less of the sort of taboos, so to speak, and the rigidness and violence of, of the chimpanzee version of that. But yet they are genetically almost identical. They, they are the closest relationship to each other in the primate species, and both chimpanzees and bonobos are the closest relationship to humans. And they split because of different environments. The bonobos evolved in forest, lush forest rain, rainforest regions, while the chimpanzees evolved in extremely brute desert conditions, generally speaking. And that is the issue. That is the issue of why they behave so differently, is the environment. So now, take that into account as sort of a, of a broad example of, of this analysis anthropologically. When you look at human society with our forebrain, the fact that we actually have some degree of consciousness, that we're not bound by impulsive reactions, uh, it's, it's preposterous to, to think that we, in our, in our general consciousness, just can't get over some kind of behavior if we're aware of it. Um, as Marshall McLuhan once stated very poetically, Nothing is inevitable as long as people are able to think about them, think about the ideas. So what you have is this primitive assumption. I mean, Jordan Peterson's preposterous because he uses lobsters, which is completely insane, <laughs> because why would you ever do something like that because of serotonin or however he argues it and think that you're going to impose the hierarchy of lobsters on the human condition? It just it blows my mind. At least use analog prime, analogs that are closest to humans like chimpanzees and bonobos. So here's my point. Everything has a sort of hierarchy when it comes to skills. A baseball player, when he goes to you know a so, excuse me a softball game, will say, and he's, he might be the best hitter of his entire community. He might teach kids how to be a better hitter. He is involved in a fundamental hierarchy of education because of his skill set, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Granted, he might also be at the very lowest level of of the janitorial staff in some company, right? So in that hierarchy, he is absolutely poverty-stricken. He is the lowest level. He, is, he has no, no high position whatsoever in that hierarchy. And that is the dangerous form of hierarchy, the economic hierarchy. The idea that these natural forms of hierarchy, which we do exist in, that have no actual complications, unless you get into ego battles about who's better at something or not, and that's kind of a separate conversation. The danger is that if you believe in hierarchy and you just transpose it on every single thing in society, then you're just going to justify the fact that Jeff Bezos has $160 billion and he deserves it because he deserves that because he's on the highest part of the, but he's the winner of capitalism, as I think the one, one person once joked, because it's pretty much the best way to think about it. He won so far. Um, that kind of hierarchy is super dangerous to consider and to say is normal, because it's allowing for the complete destitution of half of the world's population, enormous people, enormous numbers of people remain in poverty with very low public health status, something that does not, does not need to occur, as I've argued over and over again, because of the actual resources we currently have at our disposal and the efficiency we can create to literally take care and make sure no human being on this planet is in poverty. It is a system consequence that this hierarchy, this economic hierarchy, or more accurately, the socioeconomic hierarchy, is not just about money, it's about all the other unfoldings that happen when you are born into destitution. You have limited, op you have limited um, abilities to do lots of things. The brain is damaged in many cases because of the kind of social condition that is created by poverty. And I talk a lot about that in my movie as well, excuse me, in my book, and I touch upon it a little bit uh, in my movie as well. So I hope, I'm getting to my, hope you're understanding my point here. Hierarchy in the human condition is inevitable based on the difference of people and their skills. Hierarchy as a superimposition economically, where literally people are starving because of the structure of our society, that is not to be uh, considered human nature. And, and there's plenty of other evidence to show that humans have lived non-hierarchically in the past. The hunter-gatherer cultures that existed before the Neolithic Revolution, the dawn of agriculture, those that have been studied in the early 20th century by great sociologists such as Margaret Mead, and in combination with other existing hunter-gatherer societies such as the Piaha in the Amazon, we see non-hierarchical groups. They don't have hierarchy. In fact, they fight it. Believe it or not, and I'll end with this, not only were early hunter-gatherer tribes aware of the necessity to not have hierarchy because they felt it was, it was wrong, not only because of that, they also had a, excuse me, I'm gonna, let me reverse that, not only did they have a, have a uh, social foundation in their economy that didn't produce hierarchy because they're hunter-gatherers, right, 
They didn't produce hierarchy as, a, as, a, as an outcome of their economy. But they were also wise enough to know not to allow power, control, and domination to start. And it's what's called reverse dominance hierarchy, coined by Christopher Boehm, another sociologist. And if you look at these indigenous people that still exist today, not only do they not have an economy that creates it, they are actively opposed to it because they know that there is still a tiny sickness that does exist, which I would agree to, but they stop it and they actually ridicule people. If someone comes into their tribe flaunting themselves or trying to make themselves feel superior, the entire tribe gangs up on them and it humiliates them just to make sure they get knocked back down to their level. Now, that's just an interesting aside, and uh, it's not the defining characteristic of all this. I support a new economy because if you change the structure of the economy, you will change all of these hierarchical outcomes, and then and, and for the better. I really believe, as stated in the movie, if you look at the public health outcome of people in hierarchy, the, the stratification itself, the inequality and the sickness that it creates – you are literally polluting society. There's tremendous work that's been done by people like Richard Wilkinson out of the UK, the, the Equality Trust, they call it, where they go straight down the line of all the things that a socially, a socially stratified economy does to people, and there isn't one positive effect, not one. The only thing that people will say is positive is that, oh, it helps innovation because poor people want to be rich people. And that is another preposterous assumption to say that, we're not going to innovate. We're not going to be creative as a, as a civilization without the need to want to be somebody else or to be richer. That, that in and of itself is one of the most cynical things. Uh, socio excuse me, psychologists. Sociologists would never say that. One of the most cynical things these Darwinistically oriented psychologists have come up with. So anyway, I could rant on and on about that. No, no. I hope that helps. This is good stuff. But um, I, I was wondering what you, you think about uh, the arguments of people like uh, Steven Pinker. Who, who argue that these are the best of times right now, uh, despite um, some of the, the negative things that we've heard. Um, you know, he, he talks about all the innovation that has been um, produced and, and how it's um, helped people all over the planet, that we don't have the same kind of poverty that we used to, that the world is less violent, that even the poor have qualities of life lives that are much better than even wealthy people had years ago. I mean, I'm not doing a good job of summarizing his argument. I'm sure you've heard I've, it. I've read but, Pinker's work, and I understand the argument. Yeah. Well, he's half right. What's happened in the evolution of this economy upon the Industrial Revolution, which is basically where his analysis has to start, it, everything else is far vaguer before then. But when the dawn of the Industrial Revolution and mechanization and the true use of technology which eventually became fortified by information technology when, com when computers and all of that processing power started to rise as well, is you created a vast form of economic efficiency in production and distribution that didn't exist before, that was able to rise up above the natural limitations of the capitalist model. Now, the first thing to understand, why are people poor on this planet? Why were they ever poor? Do we believe that, that people were just always poor until capitalism was able to march around through markets and globalization to bring people out of poverty? Poverty, by definition, when you, don't, when you dismiss the, the nutrition factor, when you say, okay, once someone has their nutrition and they can get water and they are not being bombarded in an open environment, they have some kind of roof, how do you define poverty at that point? It has to be a social relationship. When you go to these small indigenous places where people are living quite happily, that have very high happiness indexes like Costa Rica, and yet you look at their money, look at their, their per capita spending, look at what people have, their, their wages and their annual pay, it's, it's extreme poverty. But yet they're actually happy about it because they're not exposed. They live in a different world where they don't feel the need for more and more. That's an important distinction to make. I think it's very important that we look at this as a social construct, a global phenomenon. And when people perceive others as having more, it triggers something in them to think that they're missing out and they want to have more, and hence you have this whole sickness of inequality. I just think that's important to state up front. In terms of Pinker's direct relationship, though, he doesn't account for that. He doesn't account for the fact that we have had people living perfectly happily until the inequality and the forces of colonialism and globalization came in and it, it turned everything up on its head. Colonial powers came in and created the long-term poverty of these nations once they left. Same with globalization. You can't look at the poverty in India without looking at the British Empire and the British East India Company and the empire colonialistic power uh, that they put forward. 
This is how poverty was created. So to say that the same system, and I, again, I think it's equivocal. I think the same mo the mode of operation, excuse me, that, that lures a company and a, and, a, uh, and a nation to go and steal resources from another nation for their own benefit, as the British East, India, British East India Company did over and over again, that is a mode of capitalist interest. That is what the system does. It's about acquiring more capital to enrich oneself. That is the M.O., and to say that this poverty being alleviated now by technology alone within the structure is somehow makes it all nullified is, is insane to me. Capitalism created poverty on this planet. It, poverty is a social inequality-driven phenomenon. And we have destabilized the world because of this, because of this inequality phenomenon. And we can't just sit back and say that we're resolving you know, extreme poverty now after all these centuries uh, and say, well, everything's great now. We should preserve capitalism because it's accomplished this. It's the thing that got us in that problem to begin with. So that's the first thing to point out. The second thing is his metrics are fundamentally wrong when you look at poverty. So if, if, if you look at the ethical poverty line put forward by Northwestern University, they find that 60% of the world is technically in poverty uh, in the world today. And the alleviation has only happened in like the one – excuse me, the dollar fifty. So if you're using just the, just the statistic that people are no longer, excuse me, there aren't as many people living in a dollar, under a dollar fifty a day, uh, and that's your number, then yeah, you're going to see an alleviation of extreme poverty. But when you raise that number to a true livable level, like $5.50, suddenly you see everyone's still in poverty, and everyone's still in a very destabilized place because of the fundamental inequality built into the structure. So I hope that makes sense. I think Pinker's analysis is right on target up until, in general, up until about the mid-90s, and everything that's happening now from climate destabilization to pollution to the rise of inequality to the rise of authoritarianism to the reduction of lifespans in certain areas of the United States and beyond. COVID has sealed the deal in part, but you didn't even need COVID to do this. Everything is now in decline once again. So he has published his book right at the peak of his argument, and I guarantee you, if nothing changes, it's going to continue to go down. Violence will increase. That's another thing I'm going to say very briefly. One thing he doesn't touch upon in this book is what's called structural violence, something I bring up in the film, and that is the vast amount of destruction socioeconomic inequality does to the average person in the form of structural violence, which takes many different, different contexts. Violence can't just be looked at as war. It has to be looked at as the public health condition. And when you're putting so many people into poverty still that are vulnerable to all these circumstances that create aberrant behavior, that, again, as I said earlier, will poison the minds of young children when they lose 13 IQ points because of the exposures that increase domestic abuse and all of the stuff, mental, physical, emotional, that happens to people in low socioeconomic status, you can't just say that that isn't violence. Uh, I very much consider it to be. That's what Gandhi said. Poverty is the worst form of violence. And his intuition was way ahead of its time. Because when you look at epidemiological research, the most dangerous thing you can do to any human being is put them born in low socioeconomic status. That is, I, that's absolutely the case. So he didn't touch upon that either. Anyway, I could ramble on other things that is that issue. <laughs> I think Tinker, once again, does a good job on one level, but he kind of naively promotes things he hasn't thought all the way through. And I think it does no service to humankind right now to sit there and be a be a, a gainsayer and say, well, we've gotten a lot better. Isn't that enough? No, it's not. It's not enough. What's on the horizon now is far darker than anything human civilization has ever seen. We're speaking with Peter Joseph, and his new film is Interreflections. And believe it or not, this discussion that we're having is directly related to the the topics that they talk about in this movie. And also you can find these ideas expressed in his book, The New Human Rights Movement. Um, I, I think you're right in, in being concerned about the effects of globalization and imperialism. Um, you, you see countries, though, today uh, that also recognize that. And, and there's some leaders who, in trying to fight it, are resorting to isolationism, nationalism. And I think some people are equally frightened about that. Um, the, the one thing I'd like some clarification on in terms of what it is that you, you think we need to do, D do you believe that we need some kind of reset? Do you believe that we need to have some kind of one world government eventually? Like, what is it exactly that you, you think it is that we need to do to ever get out of this structure that you're critical of? Well, when you say the word reset, that that sparks the image of a of a jubilee, uh, particularly 
So, in other words, if you don't get rid of the mass debt that is produced uh, consequentially through the market system, excuse me, through the monetary system, we always produce more debt than money in existence. I hope everyone understands this. Right now, there's probably 230 trillion in outstanding global currency, and there's about 83 trillion, trillion uh, excuse me, there's 203 trillion outstanding debt. Sorry, I'm tired. And there's only about 82 trillion of outstanding currency. So, how are we going to pay off all this debt? with only that amount of currency. Uh, the system creates debt as a structural uh, force that you know, ef effectively keeps the lower class uh, oppressed. That's, that's not even in a Marxist perspective. That's just what the system does structurally. So anyway, I'm not going to jump on that tangent. You mentioned you know, reset. That's exactly what I would say needs to happen in terms of that particular issue, which would free things up for more productive stuff. Will that happen? Probably not. As far as what needs to happen in general, I don't support any kind of global government per se. I support a global awareness of what sustainability principles mean and what public health principles suggest. Uh, if you take an epidemiological system science perspective, what we need to do as a civilization becomes readily apparent. And I think the form it's going to take is going to be through localization more than any kind of global arrangement. I think that the technological development we see through what's called ephemeralization or what Jeremy Rifkin calls zero marginal cost, if we can do it right, we can start to create means by which we live with the lowest possible impact. And we do this by breaking away from normal society, not in like a cultish way or you start like a little commune, but in our existing realities, we start to get off the grid. And over time, and I, I really think this is going to be the trajectory, over time you're going to have networks of people in cities that no longer are using the established mechanisms because technologically, excuse me, technology has advanced so much that they're able to literally be off the grid as a society. Now, there are dangers to that. If you imagine a nation doing that, uh, it would be attacked by other nations, no doubt, because any nation that doesn't support the neoliberal establishment is looked upon as anti-human rights and all that propaganda that we see uh, even to this day. But I think that that is going to be the method by which we break out of this. Localization, as Gandhi stated, oceanic circles are overlapping societies through oceanic circles, is the way he put it. And I agree with that even in his primitive sense of organization, long before the advent of extreme technology that could be used to our favor right now. So you have people localized, but when something does go awry, they do have connections to other pockets of civilization, whether it's a town or a city or a nation, and then those problems are resolved. I know it's a very gross oversimplification, but that's the way I see change happening. Um, I, I think that the political establishment is far too bought off and far too – it's evolved in such a malicious way in the Western big powers, the powers that really are causing most of the trouble – that you have to start doing something different as an activist. So anyway, I'm jumping around here. I really think localization, and through a lot of things I talk about in my book, The Human, Human Rights Movement, I, I list five different things. You have to move uh, from labor, autom excuse me, from general labor for income to automation deliberately. So you, know, you have to, you have to um, work to localize. You don't want you know, globalization importing strawberries from Chile to bring to California when you could easily engineer agricultural systems to do that yourself. I support people that have independent tool libraries, time banks, and this emerging infrastructure that I really think will eventually bring on sustainability, at least in local, local regions. The challenge, though, unfortunately, is if the power establishments of the, in these nations and their big industries, you know, the major polluters out there really come from the big nations. Uh, if they don't stop their behavior deliberately, then we're all going to be in trouble because right now nothing is slowing the ecological decline uh, at all. And that's where I think a big strike, you have to have a mass strike against these institutions to get them to shut down their behaviors, while simultaneously you have people getting off the grid locally in their societies. So I've jumped around a lot there. I know that's a big thing to swallow, and I can tell already people are going to attack all sorts of facets of that <laughs> because I'm not being as specific as I could, but that's for a much deeper conversation. But to summarize, you need a global consciousness that supports true ecological sustainability and public health. It's an educational imperative, and you need to get people to start engaging in behaviors and systems that are not based on the market system of economics. The farther you get away from market capitalism, the healthier we are going to be because the system itself is toxic to both our public health and our environment, our habitat. And you do believe that there is, within our immediate future, the capability due to technology to create a world with, like, surplus for everyone. I, I think I've heard you say that that's, that's capable, that we're capable of doing that. 
It's really just uh, governments and, and people preventing us from doing that. Is that what you believe, more or less? Or? Of course. I mean, you, the, the subject of, of economic efficiency is a big one. And what I mean, when you think about how you live or how I live or how anyone lives, what, what is the proper way of life in the sense of sustainability and efficiency? Is it advantageous for us to promote a consumeristic society that's based on infinite growth? Is it advantageous for us as a culture to look up to people, billionaires, who own 100 cars and 10 mansions and have outrageous carbon footprints or what have you? There has to be a rationalization of the way we live and it leads to your point, your question about surplus. Well, first of all, when you talk about surplus, what does that mean? It means that your basic necessities of life are met, first of all. That should be at the ground level. Just like people talk about you know, health insurance as a human right, well, it should go far beyond that. The industrial efficiency we have to feed, clothe, and house, and provide resources and materials to every human being on this planet is ever apparent. The reason we can't do that is because of the inequality-driven neuroses and the false scarcity that we've created in this system that says, well, sorry, we can support this guy as $160 billion, but we can't get, you know, uh, we can't get funds to you in the lower class that are you know, thousands of dollars in debt, can't afford your next emergency, uh, that are not meeting educational requirements, the family, and so on and so on and so on. So do you see my point? When I say surplus, it's not that there's an infinite amount of anything that people can, can have. It's, that's obviously not the case on any habitat, in any ecosystem. There has to be a fundamental awareness of people that they need to, A, be able to share the world, and B, organize in a sense that allows everyone to get what they need, because if you don't, what do you get? You get social destabilization. I think the entire rise, by the way, of this authoritarian regime of Trump and what's happened across the world is a consequence of this alienation. People are so frustrated by the fact that they can't get their basic needs met or they just went bankrupt because of their health cost, as, which is, the, by the way, the largest cause of bankruptcy in the U.S., which is insane. I think they're so alienated and confused that they just start fighting the system, like flailing their hands against uh, the wind, so they're not aware enough of what's actually causing, or excuse me, what's keeping this terrible social stratification in place. So does that, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, sure. You know, w one of the things I'm curious about is y you seem like a very genuine person. You seem very upset about the inequality that exists mm -hmm. in the world. And I was wondering, uh, this is such a basic question, but in terms of morality, where, where, where do you base your assumptions on right and wrong from? Uh, some people get it from religion. I, I know your work has, um, you know, um, studied religion and, and, and you've talked a lot about the, um, the, the effects of a religion on society. Um, but in terms of morality, where, where do you think um, you get it from and, and, and where should people find their morality in life from? I, in, in the natural processes that we see around us, in our understanding of, of the science of existence. And I don't mean that abstractly. I think if you look at the way, other eco, excuse me, the, way the ecosystem works in general, if you look at the way habitats have formed and become stabilized, you begin to see the dynamics within about how organisms operate in order to ensure their future survival. Morality is about what works and what doesn't in a sense Meaning, for example, okay, it's, it's amoral for people to be really poor. Okay, well, can that, just, can that situation exist indefinitely? No. It's unstable. Poor people will eventually get angry and rise up periodically. Is it, is it amoral to kill somebody? Well, that could be a religious debate. I would argue that if you kill somebody, you are planting seeds for other levels of violence. You are creating, you are creating excuses for other people to get upset, and hence these chain reactions. So I see it, as cold as this may sound, as an issue of function. What is right and wrong to me is what works and what doesn't in the context of human sustainability and public health. That's the broad scheme. Now, we can go deeper into more net morality as far as an aesthetic, because I think that's really where a lot of people's moral sensibilities come from. I feel horrified when I walk past a homeless person on the street because I'm very empathic. Uh, it's, a, it's a moral reminder. It, it's a moral feeling. I truly would feel outrageously fucked up, messed up, if I was to witness somebody 
on on a on the street, excuse me, if I was in a war and somebody got shot next to me, I would probably be distorted for the rest of my life because there is a fundamental aesthetic where you are not designed to experience that kind of violence. We are, we are a social organism. So we have that aesthetic uh, that is morally oriented based on our experience and empathy and our mirror neurons and so on, and I think that's a big part of it. But to definitively answer your question, I get my cues from natural science. I don't know where else it would make any sense. You can take all the religious uh, distinctions of morality, and, and if you just break them all down, they, they're all, first of all, completely contradicted. It's not like moral philosophy through religion has ever had a positive effect. I mean, I don't believe that anyway. I mean, I mean that's for another conversation, so I won't go down that, go down that road. <laughs> so I don't know if you ever watched uh, the Peterson-Sam Harris debate, but I guess you would side with uh, Sam Harris. He, he thinks morality can be found in science. Yeah, I don't see, I don't yeah. see where it could come otherwise. Okay. I mean, obviously it's not going to come from traditional stories that we invent. It's either going to come from our perception of the way the world works or doesn't work, or it's going to come from, as I said before, our aesthetic, our, our, our empathy, our feeling that we get. Like when somebody gets hurt, that's why, you know, when somebody gets hit by a car, usually a bunch of people rush to try to help that person. You know, we have this sort of innate need I, I, whether it's selfish or not is debatable some people will say well it's all selfish because you know you see yourself in that position so therefore you want you know you want to make sure someone would take care of you i think that's a little bit of a stretch i think people just have a, a cute aesthetic sensibility to things like that and it does carry over into their moral sensibilities over time as well so that's another level of it well, i wish we could get into this a little bit more but we, we kind of have to wrap things up i, I guess the last thing i want to ask you about is you're very good at talking about all these issues you're very smart and and this book the new human rights movement is one that i highly recommend to our uh, to our listeners that you read and and a lot of these ideas are in the film the inter reflections but as you mentioned earlier you, you started off as a, a musician and, and you ended up in film and somewhere in between you, you started becoming um, this spokesperson for all these different ideas. Um, I, I wonder for you, um, what you personally get out, get out of the experience of like, when you show a movie, I know there's not audiences now that, in, that are in theaters, but, um, I'm sure you've had a couple screenings, uh, I don't know with who, but that experience that you have when you show a movie to an audience, um, that's so different than like what we're doing right now, having a conversation, what is it like for you when, when you produce a piece of art and it has ideas in it and, and, and people see it and you can see them responding to it? What is that like for you? Um, it's an interesting question. I, I subscribe to the artistic view that when you create something, you do it um, based on your own sensibilities. You don't let the, the assumption or the interest to appeal to others get involved. I think the great artists, and again, I'm speaking in general, I'm not referring to myself as a great artist. This is just the method by which I think holds true. You look at a Picasso or a Matisse, or you listen to some great music by Bach, or, or you look at beautiful, beautiful films that have, that, have, that have executed in certain ways, you realize that most of the great artists that are doing this are not considerate of who their audience is. They're not trying to appeal. I think the great commercial danger we've seen throughout our society is the fact that everything's become formulaic. No one creates things anymore, at least rarely as much as they used to, based on their own aesthetics alone. Uh, instead, they try to think about how they're going to market this movie. They think about how it's going to appeal to this net. Will it be accepted to film festivals? Does it have to be this length? Maybe I should start it with the word A so it gets up in the listings of, of all the people that search for videos online. This is all the stuff I've talked to people about, by the way, in the marketing community. Yeah. And I, I find it just grotesque. I think that it, deep down this work is an artistic film to me, even more than an intellectual exercise, even though I, I think they're both equally as important, and it does have a certain function. But I allow myself to do something that is just personal to me. I like it. And I think if, aesthetically speaking, if I really believe in it, other people will have a sympathetic resonance to it, and it will build a new audience if it doesn't have one already. That's my hope. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. At least I'm still true to myself. So going back to your point, if, you know, I, I did screen it in late January in a very rough stage, and everyone was very supportive. It was more of the choir of people that had been following my work for a while. But I listened to people's complaints and, and difficulties with it simultaneously, and I you know, talked about it. But ultimately, I have to say it, it's not an issue of arrogance. It's not an issue of inflexibility or a lack of influence. 
Um, I simply don't create things for the interests of other people. I, I can't allow myself to do that. And I think every good artist deep down should approach it like that. You maintain your vulnerability in the experience and how you learn and go about things. But if you're sitting in your brain trying to think about how to design something to have an effect on somebody else, I think you've already kind of failed. Uh, I think you have to be true to yourself. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with what you were saying in terms of what should motivate someone to, to make a film or make music. I, I guess I was just talking more to the, the, the feeling that you have when, when you get to, to enjoy it with a sympathetic audience or even as a musician that's what when, I, mean, yeah. I, I don't really put myself in a position to to, to feel it that way yeah <laughs> like I'm, I'm not about to read any reviews of my movie i'm All not right. about to uh, go on uh, that journey of to see who likes it and who doesn't yeah it's out there and it's it is what it is and i'm happy to talk about it but when it comes to people's opinions and gripes and so on um i just make myself immune to it well I think people are going to enjoy this film. Uh, Thanks. You know, I, I, I'm, and I'm not just saying that. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there who are equally frustrated with the, the formula that most movies follow. And you, you sit down to watch this, and, and you know you're on a ride that's a little bit different. And it's always engaging. It's always thought-provoking. It's creative. It's funny. Um, it makes you think. So um, I, I'm going to highly recommend this film for people. Um, thank you, Tom. You know, thank so you very much. Yeah, thank and, you. and I congratulate you. And um, why don't you give people your information so that they can find out about all your work and find out about screenings and stuff? Yeah, well, uh, screenings being the condition we're in right now, I'm, I think we'll, I'll probably have some smaller independent screenings that people could do on their own. Uh, I don't think I, I'm going to see much of a large uh, screening release anytime soon for obvious reasons. The, the virus and so on. But you can go to interreflectionsmovie.com, interreflectionsmovie.com, and that is the main site for it. And then as far as myself, I'm peterjoseph.info. And I have a podcast, I do all sorts of stuff, but most of that can be found uh, linked through on my main site, peterjoseph.info. And the film itself is available on a smattering of cable on demand and uh, internet VOD on demand, so it shouldn't be that difficult for people to find it if they do a search. And, and what do you say to people who who say, like, oh, you should just put it out like Zeitgeist so we can spread it on the Internet. Well, because I made Zeitgeist for no money. <laughs> the film cost me an enormous amount of money, to which I am in an enormous amount of debt. Believe me, if I could, I'd do everything for free. I believe in that, but that's just not the commercial reality of people trying to exist. This is my main ambitious project. The next thing I do will be a more straightforward documentary that I'm currently planning. And I intend to become more prolific as well. I mean, I, this film just drained me for so long um, that I'm going to be doing a whole lot more. And, and some of that will definitely be out for free. Uh, people need to <laughs> just remember that you can't just do everything for free. I know. But right now I'm looking <laughs> at these outrageous number of pirates that have uploaded my film to hundreds of pirate sites, like torrents. And I'm just like, God, all you guys are doing is killing me with oh, man. lack of sales. But, I mean, that's just the way it is. I, I can understand I can understand, in fact, just as a final point, why people have lured, excuse me, have been moving towards documentary in the independent realm and why doc independent filmmakers don't bother with, with dramatic narratives of such com high complexity, because it's just, you're not going to make money off of it. The whole, the whole thing is so polluted. It's like the music industry. They don't make money off of record sales anymore. They have to go on tour and charge you $200 for a ticket to make money. Right. So that's, that's just the way things have happened, for better or for worse. Um, I, in the end, I just hope it gets out there and people... Uh, experience it one way or another so well please support this movie we're, we're talking with peter joseph into reflections is the film once again the book is the new human rights movement and peter as usual it's a it's a pleasure speaking to you and i hope we can do it again absolutely thanks again tom i really appreciate it all right take it easy good night bye-bye